giant hornets. Can they fly? Yes, of course they can. Eggs. 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 Can they fly? No, absolutely not. <gasps> Hey, Kevin? Yeah, Daryl? What do you reckon about flying? Oi, oh, Tess! Stop bloody bouncing your sister into the coral tree! Mm -hmm. Bloody caviar! Sorry. Help? What were you saying? I was, um... I was just talking about flying. Oh, right, right. Why? Oh, I don't know. I just think it might be really interesting to see the world from that uh, angle. Wait, are you, are you saying you want to fly? Um, well, maybe. But you're an egg. Yeah, I know, but I, I could wear a helmet or something. Oi, Tess! Stop putting the bloody decorative pebbles up your nostrils! Look, Daz, I, I just don't think eggs are meant to fly, mate. Mm -hmm. Ow! Tess, what did I just say? Oopsie. Flight Simulator, where you can fly anywhere you can dream of, as long as you are not an egg. Please verify that you are not an egg. <sighs> Melanie, do you reckon I can have a go at flying your kite? Um, I don't know, Daryl. Isn't it illegal for eggs to fly or something? Well, yeah, maybe, I don't know, but I wouldn't actually be flying myself. I would just be, you know, holding your... Oi, babe, is... is this egg bothering you? Because I'll end him if he is. No, sorry, I was just... Oh, my God, that's, like, so romantic. <coughs> Melanie, <coughs> you're kind. <coughs> All right, Humpty Dumpty. Do you know why you're here? Um, uh, I tried to fly. You tried to fly. And do you know what happens when eggs try to fly? Um, they have fun. This is the third time this year you've tried something like this. What's going on, Daryl? I, uh... You're a good guy, Daryl. I'm gonna let you off with a warning. But this is the last time, okay? You should really get some help, mate. for housing tiny embryonic life forms that have evolved over millions of years to live in complete symbiotic harmony with one another. But can eggs fly? Yes, I think they can. 
Hey folks, slated for release on the Epic Games Store later this year, The Wolf Among Us 2 will be Telltale Games' first title in Unreal Engine. To introduce fans back into its fantasy world, the team stepped into the game's Godmother's Bar with a virtual set system for in-engine interviews. Hear from Telltale Games' CEO, CTO, and the folks at the AV Society on their approach to the live set and the game's transition to Unreal Engine. Over the past 12 months, we've seen an increasing number of automakers turn to real-time technology to virtualize workflows. We've updated our comprehensive automotive field guide with the latest information on real-time automotive trends, use cases, and technologies. Steer over to the Unreal Engine feed to dive in. And what started as a way to help car designers ideate faster is now a showcase for what a single artist can do with Unreal Engine and Substance 3D's growing collection of physically accurate automotive materials. Discover how this gorgeous x Taon concept car project was driven by a single artist's studio. Calling all creatives in Australia and New Zealand. Do you have a story you've been dying to tell? Well, the Unreal Engine Short Film Challenge is back with an expanded training program. Get more details and sign up for an opportunity to get your work in front of major studios from the Unreal Engine feed. In our first spotlight, you'll reap what you sow. Meat Light is a peaceful farm sim. By day, manage your great uncle's forge, befriend the local wildlife, and support your neighbors. But at night, venture into the spirit world to discover the secrets of the universe. Learn more about Meat Light at KamaiProduction.com and wishlist the game on Steam. Inspired by the Chaumont sur Leroy's castle, Omar Suisi recreated its likeness into the digital realm. The elegant structure was built by hand, with the environment and props sourced from a handful of UE creators. Tour the grounds on Omir's ArtStation page. Hope you're hungry! This medieval food stall has plenty for all of us. What started as a simple scene bloomed into the stunning learning experience you see before you, crafted by Manoj R. They've put together a lovely breakdown of the scene and its elements on their ArtStation page, but be sure to share your feedback with them in the forums. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hello everyone and welcome back to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I am your host Tina and today with me we have some incredible guests. First up here we've got Patrick Wambold, if you would like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Patrick. I'm a solution architect here at Epic Games, working mostly in the live events and broadcast uh, verticals. Cool. Pleasure to have you here, very excited. Yep. <laughs> and next up we have here. Warren Drones. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm Warren Drones. I'm a senior product specialist here at Epic Games. Uh, work mostly with the broadcast team for broadcast and virtual production. Awesome. And then last but certainly not least, we have Andy Blondin down here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, Andy Blondin. Uh, I'm a director of product management for the broadcast live event side of things. Um, happy to be on with you guys and be able to chat about our project that we had just launched this last week. Yes, yes, which, speaking of which, let's dig right in. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about the hype chamber and the broadcasting sample? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so starting back in about uh, springtime of 2021, uh, we, as you guys know, push out samples as the engine team, and we were looking for some ways to kind of kick the tires a little bit on broadcast motion graphics and something that we could do for putting on a, a graphics package with a, a live show. So we started to you know, kick around ideas of what we could do. Um, well, little did we know Rocket League was doing the same thing on their end. They were going through a, a internal rebranding kind of effort and our, our paths kind of crossed and we started to discuss like, hey, why don't we do this together? We could put out an engine sample that shows how we use our own engine to drive the esports content for the show. Um, mm -hmm. And so the things, the stars kind of aligned and we just said, yeah, like this is uh, a great idea. Let's dive in. And so uh, last spring, we started to formalize, like, what does that look like? Um, and at the time, we both were working with a company called Capacity Studios, which um, mm -hmm. is an awesome animation and motion graphics uh, studio based out of uh, Los Angeles. But they, they do great work for all kinds of game companies and broadcast companies. And in a prior life, I had worked with them a little bit um, in the broadcast industry and always admired their work. And 
And lo and behold, they had been doing a lot of cinematics work for our Rocket League team. So if you've ever seen those intro cinematics, um, Psyonix is helping with a lot of those. And so we thought, man, let's all get together. Let's design some of these that uh, feel a bit like sports motion graphics, but give it a Rocket League treatment. Um, so mm-hmm. our LCS was going through a change at the time too. They were moving away from this whole league structure into more of a an event-based team that would gather points and move on. And so they were rethinking the way they were doing their broadcasts, which as well um, might be a little bit for people who don't know broadcast, but you have to produce a lot of assets. And so um, there was a lot of discussion around how real time could benefit that if we could speed up the production by using the Unreal Engine to power a lot of the content. So as the design started to formalize, we started to really develop uh, this branding that was very vibrant in its look. It was very colorful and team-based driven. And from a prior life, when I was doing a lot of sports motion graphics, you know, like there's almost infinite combinations of those things that can make air. And so you have to prepare all of those. Well, a real-time renderer is fantastic for that kind of a thing because you can basically program one graphic can become any graphic. And so... Um, that's some of what, what uh, Warren's going to show today was a little bit of the system behind that. And that's what we kind of kicked out with the sample. But um, yeah, it was a partnership between uh, Capacity. And so a shout out to, to Corey uh, on the Psionic side and to Ellery and Benji and Jazz and all them who really helped us kind of bring everything together. But it culminated into the events uh, that happened this fall with some of the majors and some of the work that we've done um, since then with some of the other tournaments. And so we'll highlight both the animation package, some of the rendering that we've been able to do to kind of offload and the studio to populate the graphics using Unreal. So um, some of our goals setting into this was a a couple things was we wanted high fidelity motion graphics that looked like it was offline rendered, but we want to do it in real time. So as many people know, we have an offline or a a ray tracer that looks almost like it's pre-rendered in many cases, but we can do it in real time. And so, uh, you know, it would reduce the amount of content and time that it takes to get stuff to air. So the amount of savings and like versioning went through the roof. Um, The other thing was, um, you know, the branding needs, we needed to make it feel like it wasn't just, um, you know, lesser quality. Like we wanted to maintain this high level of quality that looked really good for their brand. Um, We wanted to be team color driven, as I mentioned. And we wanted this whole kind of 360 environment to be highly customizable, easily to swap in teams or sponsors, um, which also mm-hmm. leads to like more sales opportunities for you know people who want to sponsor, whether it's Ford or 7-Eleven or Lamborghini, have all done sponsorships with uh, Rocket League. So anyway, um, that was a little bit about some of the goals of the project and what we were doing. Um, I think what I want to do next is show you guys the sizzle reel that culminates a bunch of that work. And then when we come back, we'll hand it back to Warren and he'll be able to dive in a little bit of the specifics of the project. So thanks guys. Just beautiful. Yeah. That's the best yeah. sizzle ever. <laughs> yeah, Rocket League is super. very, very blessed to work with Monster Cat, so you get great music, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> so uh, definitely, I should helps. I should mention there too. You saw some difference um, in the we we kind of initially pitched this idea of Unreal Racing League because we didn't have a team that we were working with, and when we went to distribute the sample, obviously we can't give away a hundred percent of the Rocket League assets, so we've swapped in some really cool logo treatments for these you know, teams that are, are fake teams, if you will, and um, some of the actual car assets that comes from Jaeger and things like that. So there's some really high quality stuff that's in the sample. So definitely, you know, go ahead, download it. And um, why don't we dive in with Warren? You can take over from here. 
Yeah, no problem. No problem. Um, so actually, I'm going to show a little bit of uh, stuff within the editor um, just to give you guys kind of context. And we thought it might be a good idea to kind of just walk through some of the basic core principles that are going to apply to, you know, whether you're using the sample or you're making your own kind of project that, uh, you know, is geared towards uh, creating, you know, instance graphics or your own productions. Um, so you can see here, uh, just this is just the sample projects you can download from uh, going to the Epic Game Launcher and looking at the Learn tab, or just searching for Broadcast Sample um, in the Epic Game Launcher. Um, but yeah, this scene right here is the default scene that you'll get once you uh, load the project. Um, you can immediately uh, click this little hype chamber controller right here. Um, and what that'll let you do is you get options over here to kind of start playing with configuration settings in the scene. So you'll notice like we've provided a few teams uh, so right now the default is this URL uh, team, this Unreal Racing League. You can see that there's a uh, alternate version of that team. And I'm just gonna press G to hide some of this stuff to make it a little bit cleaner for you guys. Um, and there's a couple other teams in here that don't really exist, but they exist for this uh, sample sake. Um, and what happens is when you uh, go into play mode, it's just gonna use this target uh, animation uh, that, you, that I have here. Um, so we provided uh, around like eight to 12 animations. Um, so you can see if like I clicked logo here, um, since I have this SGA team, I'm seeing that the active sequence is going to play back uh, that sequence with this logo effect. And I can kind of just preview that just really quickly here. Like if I were to double click this and just uh, get this. Actually, let's see, let's try the default team. And if I just kind of scrub through here, you see I'm getting the Unreal Racing League logo. And if I were to go back to the SGA, I get the cool owl logo um, that Capacity Studios did a good job of uh, defining. Um, but to make all this work under the hood uh, is essentially uh, two major systems. There's this idea of a uh, master controller here. And this basically communicates with a lot of different elements in the scene. So you can see uh, this backplate with this logo graphic going. We have the cool car here that has this all, all the decal information. Um, and then there's just general accent things like uh, scene color and lighting, as well as like text information. So you know uh, it, uh, which team it is and uh, it, it kind of shows that kind of text information. Actually, let me see if I can go to that. Let's go to team hype chamber. Uh, yeah, so this logo uh, here is basically being powered by uh, which team selection is going on there. Um, so I thought it might be a little bit daunting to kind of just throw you guys into the deep end and just show you how this master blueprint uh, works. Uh, you can kind of go through our documentation and follow the guys on the websites, and they'll kind of give you more of a deep dive on how this actually how this scene actually works. Um, but we thought it might be more helpful uh, to kind of just go through a simple example that kind of goes over those base principles. So I made a new level for uh, this this live stream, uh, and it just looks like this room of apples you see here. I'm going to give it a second to load. Um, in here, I only have this uh, cool car as a prop, um, just to kind of, once again, showcase the Jaeger. But there's just two sides of this. There's this uh, room left and there's room right. And I try to label everything as such. So you can see if I, uh, I only made a few simple materials. If I was to apply this melon one over here, you can see like, it just looks like a, you know, uh, a melon wall. Um, so what we're going to do is just kind of talk through, all right, if I wanted to change this side of the room, uh, this, this side of the room's wallpaper, change its text over here, and change this little accent light to kind of reflect this theme. Um, how would I do that? And that's essentially what we do in the, in the, the sample of the whole. Um, so I'm going to actually go into default with that. Um, and the first thing you need to uh, get familiar with is going to be uh, structures. Um, so structures are basically a collection of things that you might care about. So in this case, you see, uh, I might care about like this text right here, like I might want this to say Apple instead of just room left. Um, I definitely care about this material that's going here that you saw me uh, re replace, uh, replace briefly. Um, and then I might care about this lighting uh, right here to make sure it updates to the theme. So if I was to just think of those those three uh, properties that I care about, I'll just make a structure for that. And you can go to that by just right clicking, going to blueprints and clicking structure. I like to use the prefix st for structure, and let's just call it like a fruit theme. Uh, um, and once once you're in here, you can make uh, any kind of uh, variable type. So I'm just going to make one uh, for the three things we just talked about. So I might care about this uh, 
text, so let's just call it uh, text. <laughs> I'm going to make sure this is of type text. Okay. Um, I'll make another one for, let's do the uh, wallpaper. Uh, I'll just call it material to make it easier to understand. And I want this to be a type material instance. Let's go here, click that object reference. And let's do one more, just so we can have threes. Three is a good number. And let's do this uh, light color. And I'll do this as type uh, linear color. Cool. So once you have the structure, you're just going to uh, save it here. Um, but you know what? I can actually show some default. So let's say the default is Apple, like what I have in the background. And I want this material to be this Apple material. And this light, what color was it that we have here? I'll try to pull this up and I'll show, I'll just copy it from here and put it right here. Cool. So I'll save this. I don't need it anymore, so I'm going to close it out. Um, and the next thing you'll need is uh, a data table, which is the primary, uh, I guess you can say, source of blueprinting uh, that we use in the project to, uh, to manage all the themes that you see for the teams. Um, so I'll go here, right click, and you can go, oh, actually, this one's under miscellaneous, and you can see it's a data table asset. So I'm just going to click this. And the first thing data tables are going to ask is, well, what do you want to base it off of? Um, and I want to base it off the structure that I created. That's why we created it first. So if I go to this one, uh, ST fruit things, see it on the list, I'm going to click OK. I'll get a new data table. I'm going to do DT fruit things. And I'm going to pop this open right here. I'll try to make it bigger so you can see. Um, and already you can kind of see like it shows those row the it named the row the rows the same uh, categories that I pre-created in the structure. So I got a text, light color, and a row name. So I'm going to add a row to this. And then you can think of this row as like a theme that I might want to pull from. And this first one, I'm going to click here and press F2 to say I'm going to call this uh, Apple. Um, and I'm going to make the decision that I want this to be uh, changed to Apple when I'm in this theme. I want this materials, and I want this color selected. Let's just duplicate this and make another one. So let's just call this one uh, Melon. I think the text should say Melon when I have this selected. And I think the color should go to something melony. Oh, I don't know what it feels melony, but let's go with this. Oh, let's change this value down. Okay. I'll make one more just so we have three again. So I'm going to duplicate that. And what was the last fruit that I made? Uh, it's called orange, so I'll just make it an orange. And it should say color to an orangey color light I'm going to swap this out for this one as well yeah. well I'll try to do this with screen real estate so I'll make this one an orange and I think I want this one to be the melon theme so I'm gonna save this and you can kind of preview this by just clicking on the row and you see these values uh, at the bottom update to show like, oh, this is uh, this row's uh, collection of properties. So just click through them, give a little bit of a preview. All right, and then we don't need this anymore. So I'm going to close it out. And the next step is going to be, all right, well, how do I actually want to control all this? Um, I tried to organize the scene in a way that makes sense. So. You can see here that I have all these like little uh, visual assets that we don't really need to cover in this video. Um, and I have these left elements, the left light, the left room, and the left text. So this is the actual mesh that has this material in it, the 3D text uh, element in the background, and the light that's hidden up there. And I did the same thing with the right side. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a massive blueprint that's going to be able to communicate and tell all three of these things uh, 
how to update. Um, and I'll do the same with the right side. So to do that, you can just make any Blueprint Actor. You can use an existing one you have, or you can create a new one like I'm doing here. So I'm just gonna make a default Blueprint. Let's call it VP Fruit. Yeah, if I can spell Fruit Controller. And I'm just gonna immediately drag this into the scene. All right. Um, so once I have this, the first thing you wanna do is open up this Blueprint. Well, well you wanna open it up so you can see it. If I can grab this panel. Um, and I want to get some variables to know what I'm going to communicate with. Um, there's a lot of material in, in terms of like advanced blueprinting and blueprinting communication. Um, so I'm not going to, I mean, this is going to be a little bit quick and dirty. Um, but to start, I know what I'm going to want to control. And I'm and that's going to be uh, a mesh, a text, and a light. So I got to go ahead and make variables for those. Let's just call it uh, left. Uh, let's call it text and I'm going to make this a text. I'm going to make it editable so I can uh, see it. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I need to make this a text <laughs> 3D actor reference. And I'll make a category for this to keep it clean. Let's call it less. Side. Cool. And I'm going to duplicate this and say I want to do the left uh, material. Uh, the only thing I'm going to change here is its type to a material instance. And I'll do it one more time for the light. So left. And I know I want this to be a type layer. Uh, I do spotlight. Oh, actually, I, I didn't need to actually do this one. Sorry, I made a mistake on that, guys. I'll make this a static mesh actor. Prince. I got ahead of myself there a little bit. All right, so now uh, I will just go ahead and compile this and just make sure that these are exposed over there so that way I can see them. Uh, did, I, did I make the text what I needed to make? Yes, I did. Oh, this might be not a text. I'm just going to file this again. All right. So in the scene, now that if I select this uh, fruit controller here, I can go and I see all the different types of the text 3D actor that I have in the scene. Obviously, since this is all left text, I'm going to click left text here. And I'm going to, I click, call this left material, but I'll change that to just left room. Um, I want it to control the left room. So I'm going to change the material on that. And I want to control this left light over here. So just make sure that uh, those are assigned if you were going to try to do it on your own. Um, I'll go ahead and rename this one left room just to be consistent. Suzuki. All right, now that I know I have the elements in the scene that I care about, I'm going to go to the uh, construction script, actually. And we'll start trying to control this. Um, so the magic starts with the data table, as we said before. So if you right click into the Blueprint editor and you search for data table, I can, I can find this get to data table row. I'm going to add it there. Uh, and you can pick the data table that we just made up. So I see that data table fruit themes I created. And from this, you can already see it gives you a list of all the rows uh, that we created. Um, I'm going to turn this into a variable because this is what I'm going to want to use uh, to control everything. So I'm just going to promote it to a variable. And let's just call it um, my theme. one over there and I'm going to make this editable so I can control it and I'll put it into the category called control. Um, I'm going to reorder this because I think I want control towards the top. Stay organized. All right. And if I was to compile this just to kind of see where I'm at, I should see that over there. You can see it defaulted when I promoted that, uh, that variable to the default row name, which was the first uh, row, which was Apple. Um, so back in Blueprint, 
now I want to get all this information from that row. So if I was to go here and open up this data table again for you guys to look at, I want to be able to say, well, when I look up the Apple row, I want to get the text information. I want to get the material that I want to use, and I want to get this light color. So I can do that by just dragging off from this row once it's selected. And you can do it two ways. Like I can uh, go here and just drag, and you'll see this break. Or uh, if you want to be a little bit cleaner, I can just uh, right click here and just split this. So that's actually what I'm going to do. I'm just going to split it to keep it clean. Now I just want to grab the things I want to control and pretty much set them. So I know I want the text to change its text property right here. So I want to basically, uh, if I was to go to this text here in the scene, I want to just override this with a new value. So if I come here and I say, let's see, set text. Let's set the text on it. I'm going to try to make it a little bit cleaner for you. I want this text here. I want to override that. So since I've done this in the construction script, as soon as I compile, I should already see this be reflected. So I'm just going to go here so you can preview it live. And you can see it found a data table for uh, call. It found a data table row call Apple, and it found that text value that we assigned there, and it assigned it to uh, that text 3D actor we have in the scene. So I'm just going to quickly go through and do it for the rest of what I want to control in the scene. So uh, if I have the room here, I have the mesh for it. I want to set the material on it, on the mesh. Oh, I'm clicking other things. Sorry, my click and drag is a little bit different today. I know this material. I'm going to assign it. And I'm just going to grab all these and press Q to kind of line them up. Okay, not you. Sorry. Just want to drag these in. And I'll do it for the light color as well. So I know I have a light. Control grab. And say light color. All right, so I'm going to compile this. And already, well, I'm not going to see much on this side since the light color was already set to red and the text was already set that way and the material was already set this way. Um, but ideally, at this point, you can already test this by changing it to another one of your row names. So if I was to go to the data table and say I want to look at the melon row and apply those properties, I can just go back to the controller that I created here and just type in melon. And you can see all the uh, elements in the scene that I want to control have updated. So if I click on this light, I can see that the light color got changed to green, the text in the background changed, and I get this cool wallpaper on this side of the wall. So that's like the core principles. Once you uh, understand that, it, it becomes clear. It's not hard to do it for uh, the other side of the wall as well. Um, so if I was to wrap this, I might make a function. And you can make a function either here, but I'll do it over here just to make it uh, one spot for you guys to look at. So, yeah. oh, sorry, right. I'll go to the event grab. And I'll make a custom event. And let's call it uh, update left side. Now I'll go ahead and make another one for custom event. Update right side. I'll grab this stuff. I'm actually going to cut this. I don't need it here. Paste it over here. Oh. And I'll do the same again. Only difference here is I'm going to duplicate these variables and make a 
right text. I'll make it right room. I'll make a right light. I'll just make it right side. And I'll come here and I'll just replace these. And I'll replace this one. Now I can I could have consolidated this, but like I said, once again, it's a quick and dirty version. So I'm going to go to the construction strip and just call them. Um, so let's do our update left side, and I also want to update the right side. Cool beans here. And actually, I made it so it's only one theme right now, so they would both be the same. So let's just go ahead and uh, rename this, and let's call it left theme. And I'll duplicate it and make one right theme. Okay. So I'll make the right side, of course, be controlled by the right theme instead of the left theme. If I can get it. So I'm just going to compile and save this. And now back in the scene, I'm going to go I'm going to go ahead and assign the rest of those things I want to control. So I see I have a left theme and right theme slot over here. Let me just make sure I get the right text. Let me get the right room and make sure I get the right light. Okay. Um, so now uh, I should be able to go th through and independently change these. So if I were to go to orange, I can see that side update. I can kind of control this one over here. And that's pretty much the gist of it in terms of uh, overall control that we're using uh, at a simplistic level for the, uh, the virtual studio. Um, so now that you kind of understand this a little bit and how to kind of recreate this example, I'll just save it just in case anybody asks for it later. Let's go I think, back to. I think you, you put the the left light on the right side. Oh, I, think I did. I think you're right. I think this is right light. Let's see. Oh, did I assign it backwards? I did. I'm controlling there. There we go. That looks better. Thanks, Richard. You got it. Let's make it. <laughs> okay. So this is our uh, two second data table uh, fruit room example. Going to go to the main scene again, found in the sample project. And if you investigate in our controller that's acting as the master blueprint in the scene, it's essentially doing the same thing, but just with way, uh, way more properties. So you can piecemeal that. If you were to go to the top, we tried to <laughs> label it as best we could. If you go to the top, you can see it's looking for a traco, which is essentially a uh, the sports industry's version of a uh, abbreviation for a team, which we can, you know, for let's, Andy, you have a better example of like how you would describe a trico. Yeah, it's something that's often used in the sports industry. If you could imagine, I always use like Detroit Lions or Seattle Seahawks. You would just abbreviate to DET or SEA, for example. Um, it's just a code that often comes from, you know, lots of data. We need to not say the long name, but the shortened name of the team. And we do it for countries as well, like when you do Olympics or other stuff. But it's very used all throughout the uh, sports industry. So we kind of brought that same terminology, I guess, uh, in, into the Rocket League. I think they were already using some of it, but from the operator standpoint, it makes it easy to, boom, populate a team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. You can see it uh, here we have six teams, but in the actual official Rocket League uh, live version, they have of course, way more teams to account for all the uh, teams in uh, their RLCS league. So um, 
it just helps um, to keep information short. Uh, and you can see here I'm using drop downs instead. So in the uh, Melon example, the Apple Melon example, I was doing it with direct text. Um, but you can keep this a little bit cleaner if you use enums. Um, and I have one here for the teams just to make it so uh, users don't have to uh, type in uh, a full descriptor or full name to, to, to pick an option. It's just kind of dummy proofs it. Um, so yeah, back in the data table here, now that you kind of understand the principles of it, you can see we filled this, this row with a lot of different properties um, for uh, you know everything from the car's material to the icons you see in the background, uh, all the way down to the animated uh, marquee text. Uh, so I'll just demo that again really quickly so you can see all the elements that are being changed in the scene. And then I'll uh, just showcase a little of it in Blueprints to just show you uh, I'm using a sequence note to do it for the team A, which is the left side one, and we just do the same thing again for the right side. Um, so once we've collected all those values, uh, if you scroll here, you can see in these categories here, I just set a lot of properties. So we set all the team colors, we set this, uh, the spotlights, we swap the skins to all the cool decal ones, um, we swap out the 3D logo uh, plates, and we uh, update the marquee that's kind of ticking on at the bottom uh, for that team. I think that's kind of it in terms of like a very quick and dirty overview. Um, and this is just kind of explaining how it works. I think uh, Patrick's going to talk to you more about, you know, how to actually use it in uh, production and what might matter. Sure. I did, I did have one question for you though, Warren. So if somebody wanted to edit those teams or add more of their own teams, all they really need to do is go back to that main data table, right? <laughs> yeah. So part of the reason we want it to go this way um, is because in production, a lot of the time, like the person's time who has to, uh, you know, craft the logic for how this works is very valuable and you don't want to, you know, have to go to that person again and again, just to make small changes. Like if you just want to come in and make your own pink team theme, you should be able to do that um, in a very intuitive way. So data tables are a great, great way for you to just say, all right, the structure's already there. Let me add a new row. I just want to call this, you know, my team Z and change all my properties and update it. And it's immediately ref reflected. Right. And then just also like in, in other workflows, right? Like you could also import the data table from something else, right? Like it could be a CSV asset that exists elsewhere that, so somebody could not even really understand Unreal at all and create that data table and then you could import it and it could run the show, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Data tables are extremely friendly with, so the normal workflow in my past is, has been producers who don't come from, you know, the broadcast or the streaming world or that they might just have an Excel sheet or a Google sheet that already has like all the properties or uh, the list of things that they care about. And we mm -hmm. they'll just export those out or we'll pull them through like some kind of web pool. Um, and then inside of Unreal, it basically populates this or overrides the data table that we've already set up there um, and applies those values to the scene. So, yep, very common, very useful. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess I can chat a little bit about just kind of how the operation of it went when we needed to run this uh, live live for the show. So um, a couple of things that might be obvious or might not be obvious <laughs> in some cases is, you know, when you're doing a, a streaming event or any kind of a broadcast event, they're typically running at 60 frames, uh, depending on what it is. It might be 1080, it might be a higher resolution. So we, we just kind of had to lock it down and decide what we were going to do. So we wanted to do it the same way we do a normal broadcast, which was 1080p, 5994. Um, and so to kind of do this, you, you have a few different options. The route we actually decided to go for this was to use the media capture pipeline. And uh, the media capture pipeline is something that allows you to output the scene while you're running an editor um, but out of an SDI card. So right now we support two manufacturers uh, out of the box. We have uh, plugins for Aja and, or AJA, I keep saying Aja, AJA and Blackmagic. Um, and we support a variety of cards for both manufacturers. So we were, it's, we were actually testing, I think at home on uh, a Kona 4 and a Blackmagic 8K Pro. And then on site, I believe they were using the 8K Pro um, when they were doing this. And so inside the, the master blueprint that Warren uh, wrote there, which is 
like excellently documented. <laughs> so thank you for doing that. Um, there, there is a section about enabling uh, SDI output. So right now it's set up to use the media profiles. So if you wanted to do this on your own, um, you'd have to go and set up a media profile that matches your particular uh, system's configuration. Um, but once you do that, there is a really quick, easy button to just enable SDI. And I think there was a couple. Did we still leave the quality settings there, uh, Warren, or did you end up removing some of those? <laughs> we still left it there. You still can change okay. it, actually. Yeah. yeah you can talk, I can okay. share again, and you can just talk to it. I could leave it in the background for stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no worries. Um, it's all good. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there was a couple of things that we added to, to kind of just give us a little bit of extra control over this because you know, when you're running live, there's always kind of the, the, the worst case scenario that, like, all right, is something that we did causing it to drop frames? Is there a reason that it maybe it's running slower than we thought? Um, so we, we gave a couple of quality settings that if we needed to, we'd be able to quickly like disable ray tracing or turn off like certain like effects that we thought might be too heavy. Um, it ended up being okay in the end. I think once, uh, you know, once the team did a couple of good passes on, uh, on performance, um, we didn't really see any problems with it after that. Um, but that is something kind of interesting to note about this project as well is that, you know, we did run it with ray tracing. The, the main reason was to get these nice like reflections in the floor, these nice real time kind of GI looking reflections in the floor. So it did make it much, much tighter windows as to what we were able to get away with. Um, you know, there was a, definitely the capacity team did multiple redos of things for us. So I appreciate their help with all that. Um, but in the end, that's kind of what we settled on was our, okay, we want to have this look, this is the look that was approved. And so this is how we're going to run it. Um, so once you have all the media capture, you know, pipeline set up, uh, when you, he has, you can see this enable disable SDI. Um, he had a couple of other settings for quality for, yeah, those are all the settings, basically the ray tracing settings. So we could just adjust how many bounces or how many things that we wanted to have. Um, but yeah, so once you enable it out of the SDI and you pop into play mode, it's going to um, play out of uh, play out on the uh, SDI card that you're using. Um, at that point, you can minimize the editor. It's just extra overhead that you don't really need. Um, and then they would run it with an external control software. So in the actual event, um, they had a custom setup that they were using. I guess we can give a shout out to the DreamHack team. They were the ones who actually ran this on site. So um, they did a great job with that. Um, but since we didn't uh, didn't intend on distributing that part of it, um, actually, I believe Warren went back and re-rigged all of this <laughs> to work with the remote control API, which is something that we ship um, as a as a plugin. So if you're not familiar with what the remote control API is, it's something where you can go and expose properties on actors, and then those properties can be remotely controlled with a web browser. Or there's also options for other um, control protocols like MIDI, OSC, or DMX. Um, but this one, we, we went with the web um, just because there's kind of some, you want to be able to type in text. You want to be able to, uh, you know, kind of do some of these more advanced options. So he went back and re-rigged everything so that you can change all of these from a web browser um, as well. And so this way you could have, you know, Unreal running like live play out and just run it from a totally separate workstation that doesn't even run the engine. Um, so essentially when he's doing this, um, that giant data table that, you know, that we, that we had earlier, um, he's just changing values inside of that, right? Like that's kind of, you know, and inside that blueprint, like all these values are exposed. And so when he changes them and then hits something, it'll update, you know, what's happening, uh, in the viewport. Um, and this is how you can do it so that you would have a system that runs, um, you know, possibly on multiple machines for different layouts or for different, you know, configurations and then control it all from a nice little web interface. So it was really nice that he went through and <laughs> re-rigged all that. But again, you could, you could use, um, just about anything to do this. Cause at this point it is just using the, the remote API it's open, uh, you know, for, to be used from other software packages as well. So, um, definitely if you haven't played around with it, I highly recommend it, especially if you're into you know, control systems and into, you know, broadcast type workflows. Like this is really kind of where that power comes. So, so now you can give somebody this web page and they have no idea how to run the engine, but they can change the graphics for you and not, not have to worry about the technical side of it. So awesome, awesome job there. 
Is there anything I didn't cover that maybe we should <laughs> highlight? Um, yeah, that was that was really good. But the one thing maybe is like, can you show them at all, Warren, just how to expose something in the remote control, um, or just oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just expand this for a second to talk about remote control. Um, so the first step to using a remote control is to create this remote control preset asset, and you can find that under the miscellaneous tab, like you can with the data table. It's just down here. Uh, this project comes with the uh, remote control API and remote control uh, uh, web plugin already enabled for you, but you can do that by just going to you know uh, your plugins and checking them on. It'll require a restart, uh, but once you have them on, and you you'll find it in the miscellaneous section here. If you click, you'll add a new one. So it's going to be remote. RC demo. Um, you can double click this and that'll bring up a, a new panel. And this is your remote control preset panel. Um, and this is where all your properties that you might care about will go. Um, the first thing you'll notice is, at least in 427, um, is when I have this panel up, you'll see these little uh, faint closed eye icon symbols next to properties of everything you, anything you have in the scene. So if I go here onto the, the car, Actually, that's probably not a, a good example. I'll do what we actually did in the scene. Um, I'll click the controller again. And you want to control this uh, this team A uh, select. I would just click this little address right here, and it'll become an open eye to say it's exposed. And it'll get added to which group I have selected here. So you can add multiple groups if you wanted to organize it in better ways. Um, do. And you see it's selected there, so when I go to uh, at this property, it gets added under that group. Um, anything that's in this uh, preset uh, is updated live, so you can you'll see a change here as well as here. Once I uh, select another option in this list, um, so yeah, it's just a great way to just kind of almost favorite uh, properties uh, for different actors you might care about. Um, and at the same time, this is all accessible through the web browser. So as Patrick was saying, uh, this is an auto. Uh, generated uh, kind of page for you in, in a certain sense. If I click this uh, open in web browser icon on the far right here, it's going to open the same page that I was just showing there. And when you first load it, it should look empty like this because this is a new preset. Um, but you want to click this control tab here, and you'll get a, uh, by default, you'll be on this preset, preset section that'll have a full list of all the uh, remote control presets in the project. Um, so this new one that I just made is here. Um, then you can go to properties and it'll show you, uh, it kind of mirrors the uh, hierarchy and structure you have over here. So this weird G group that I made here has this property team B select here. I can click and just drag this over here. Um, and I can do the same thing with team A select. I can put them in the same panel or I can make my own panel by clicking outside of it. Um, David Gronick actually has a really good uh, uh, overview on remote control uh, web. Uh, and web browser setup, and if you're more interested in learning like how to customize this. Um, for now, I'll put them in the same tab. Um, and you can see here, it's once again uh, updating from both the website to the panel, as well as what's actually happening on the actor. Um, Andy, I don't know if you wanted to add more or give any Yeah, more. like in, as Warren's kind of saying, like some of the intention usually is for an operator is they don't need to necessarily know how the graphic is made and the nuts and bolts of it, but they do need easy interface to be able to change and swap those items uh, during the live show. So we've built this API for allow kind of ease of use around Unreal Engine. So the, the thought process there is like any property that you could control through the details panel can easily get exposed and put into that preset. And then there's a process of basically making the interface that you want. So Warren drug those in, but there's, there's sliders, there's color pickers, there's things that could be left open-ended in a sense. Um, in our case for the broadcast, we want to make it as easy as possible. So those drop downs control a lot of settings all at the same time. Um, but in theory, like anything that's controllable uh, through this property system can also go through this web API. So. Under the hood, um, there's a, a WebSocket server. Um, there's also an HTTP server. All those properties get mirrored between the engine and to the web and vice versa. So you can um, basically, if you rename something in the editor, it will rename in the web page. You can rename in the web page, it'll rename in the editor. Um, and it, it stays a live connection between the two. So 
um, it's intended to be like an easy um, interface that allows you to kind of control and customize whatever you need in the scene. Cool. And we'll probably post some links to those tutorials and the documentation too for others that want to get up to speed with it. Yeah, I, I threw a link in the one chat that I'm in for the, for the remote control that um, thing that Warren mentioned that David uh, had created for it's in the ICVFX tutorials, but I'll try and get it in both chats. But there was a question uh, that I thought was kind of relevant that said, when these are run in a live event, do they run in the editor or as a package game? And I think this is an interesting question because uh, technically you could do either. There really isn't any reason you couldn't run it either way, but I think um, having the editor open is just kind of nice because <laughs> if you need to do something yeah. quickly, it's already there and you don't have to rebuild it. Um, it does have a slight performance hit from doing that, but usually if you minimize the editor, like while it's running out of the SCI through media capture, it's somewhat negligible. Um, the only thing I would say is that there are some limitations about what you can expose in the remote API um, in a package game. And so I don't know, Warren, if you can show the project setting that shows you this, um, <laughs> but uh, there's a tick box. So if you go into the project settings, um, and go to the remote control section, there's actually a, um, a box. And you'll see a little warning screen. symbol kind of pop up. Exactly. And so if, if you have that done. on, yeah, if you have that on, it'll give you a little indicator. So it's the bottom option there. Get this one right there. Um, it'll give you a little in, uh, yeah, it's the really the bottom one exposing, uh, shows a warning when exposing editor properties that will not work in a package game. And so if you have this on and you go to your preset, you might see a little like warning symbol next to one of your properties. And this would tell you, hey, like you might want to rethink this one if you're going to put this in a package game. Um, some of the reason being behind this is uh, in a package game, properties don't actually exist anymore. So anything that is being driven needs to have a function call of some sort under the hood that actually does the work. And so I can't tell. I think on yours, everything seems to be fine on that one. I don't know if it shows up. On the one. Uh, I know for a fact that spotlight color is one that doesn't work. <laughs> so if you have a spotlight in the scene and you expose that, um, you could show what it'll look like. Um, and in the, that's just one thing to note that this yeah, is, uh, again, there aren't many things that'll have this happen, but it might be something if you do want to run in a package scenario, just to keep an eye out for. But other than that, there's not really, you know, slight performance benefit to running it in a package or in standalone, or you have a little more flexibility if you're running an editor. Yeah. The other thing to be aware of there is you, you might want to put the actual asset into the scene if you're going to pack. Um, yes. <laughs> 100% yeah, you have to. <laughs> yeah. So I would just, I would drag this into the scene. If yeah, I was you can just it. drag that in. It creates an actor that basically is the remote mm -hmm. control asset. So it goes along with it. Um, mm. Ah, there's another good question. I don't know if you guys want, <laughs> want to do questions, a couple of questions no, or nice. if you have more you yeah, want yeah. to share about. But, uh, somebody else is asking how the content in the screens is actually being done. And I think this is a good one to show. Yeah, that's a good one to show. That's fun. Right? <laughs> like what's happening? Uh, <laughs> this is a uh, kind of clever uh, workflow that the people at Capacity Studio uh, were using to kind of make it simplistic. Um, but inside Unreal, there's, there's a, a capture asset type, like a scene capture asset type. And what you can do is like basically put a camera somewhere that can capture content and it renders it to a texture. And you can use that texture in, uh, as you would any other texture by putting it into material. So that's what they're kind of doing here. I'll actually go down. Um, and they've pretty it's, much it, built this hidden layer. under system. the level. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like the, the door number two. Um, mm. Under the level here, you can see that there are some kind of motion design elements that are uh, hidden away to the user, but basically this is rendering to a texture uh, through the scene capture 2D and then used on the, the actual wall content. So the nice part about this is that it keeps all of it in one place. It's kind of like making a canvas down here so that you can kind of position or scale or move things as necessary and allows you to kind of work as a motion graphics designer would um, in almost like a separate separate level. But um, uh, I think I think I, I, oh, go ahead. 
I was just going to say the thing to note is there's a little bit of a performance overhead for doing this approach because you're capturing the scene twice. Um, so you're, you know, you kind of want to use it where you can or use it, um, you know, sparingly in the sense that you can't go nuts and have infinite amount of renders. But um, mm -hmm. it's definitely a good way to populate that wall content. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you could even show it, I guess, Warren, in that in that scene capture component too. One of the ways that you're able to kind of cut down on the performance hit is to turn on and off uh, the rendering settings that you need. So anything pretty much that you can turn off in the scene capture helps for the most part. So if you know for a fact you don't need post-process or you don't need foliage or you don't need lighting or whatever it happens to be, if you can turn it off, it will decrease the time that the scene capture um, takes. So any any of that's definitely useful. But I think this is a cool technique. I think they did they use an orthographic camera too, or I can't remember, or did they just set it like a really wide view angle? I think it's just a really mm -hmm. wide camera. Okay. <laughs> no, it's orthographic, yeah, it's, you're right. It's, yeah, it's fair. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I, I think that I think that probably just made it easier, so you don't get like that kind of warping effect of it being like uh, you know field of view. But yeah, it was actually a really good uh, technique that they kind of used for this. Um, there's another question which kind of goes nicely into something I know you wanted to talk about anyway, Warren. Which was, did you use the movie render queue to render out shots for the scissor reel example? <laughs> um, we absolutely did. <laughs> we absolutely did. Um, yeah. So for this project, we actually made a new utility uh, to try to make it a little bit easier to export out the content. Of course, like Andy said, the goal for this project was to uh, get it ready for a live operation. But, you know, realistically, sometimes you don't want to deal with like performance limits. And sometimes you want to, you know, render this at 8K resolution, which you probably can't play back live. Um, so in order to do that, Unreal has the uh, movie render queue system, uh, which can output extremely high res uh, renders. And you pretty much can uh, take any of the animations that you have in the scene right now. I'm trying to pick one. So actually, I'll showcase this logo animation right quick again. Oh, I need to actually pick one. Um, and you basically can set this animation as a target to be rendered out in Movie Render Queue. Um, so if I go here, the Render Queue Sequences, I could. In the standard workflow, I could open this movie render queue uh, panel here, add any level sequence in um, as a job item, and then kind of configure this out, and you can render that out. Um, but what happens in our world for broadcast, like obviously, like this team list is really short, but you could see if we had something like this match up here, and I'll pop it open. And, and I'll just go to a frame that kind of shows a little bit more. Um, you can see, even with this list of you know seven teams here, the the amount of combinations that you could get between these different matchups gets extremely long. So you don't want someone to uh, like manually make a new uh, level sequence for every possible combination. Um, you would want to kind of automate that in a more intelligent way. Um, so what's supplied in the project is an example under the artist elements under blueprints. Uh, da -da -da -da. There's this uh, versioning, uh, I called it EUW for editor utility widget, uh, versioning utility. If you click on it, I'm sorry, if you right click on it and select run, um, you'll get this pop up over here. I'm going to close out everything else for now. Uh, and you'll see, I'll just minimize the section to make it simple. It, looks very similar to what we have here on the controller. And that's because it is essentially doing the same thing as what you do uh, on the uh, hype chamber controller, but it does it while communicating with movie render queue and uh, curating your jobs. So just to give like a two second demo of it, um, I'll select that I want to do this matchup scene here and two teams that I want to go against each other might be CNR and SGA. Um, then under here, I have a, a, a few debug settings um, as well as like which movie render queue preset uh, you want to use. Um, you can override where it's going to be rendered to here as well. Um, and I can add a bunch of teams here if I wanted to. So I could go here and say I want it HPM versus uh, I'll add another team, SPS. And I think that's good enough for now. 
Um, but what this utility uh, widget uh, does in the background is as soon as, as, soon as I select uh, start render, it's pretty much going to uh, create uh, a new movie render queue job for every combination in here. Um, and in between rendering the jobs, it's going to uh, update the scene to reflect uh, the current uh, you know, index in that queue. So it's better to show than to talk about, but I'm just gonna double check them, double check to make sure I don't have any kind of crazy settings here. I'll do a custom beginning and frame. Let's just do three of these. Oh, let's do 10, just to make these very short renders to talk about. And I believe I have them going to video captures. Let's pick somewhere like inside of Maria. Let's call it over. I'll just click start render so you can kind of see what this looks like and you get the movie render queue uh, pop out window here so you know that that job is, uh, is starting uh, and we tried to automatically uh, name some of the rest for you i'm going to actually stop this job because <laughs> it's going to take forever because i realize ray tracing is on and the quality level is still too high um, but ideally a user uh, would be able to just uh, create as many uh, potential jobs as they want here um, and render them all out. So yeah, it's a batch render solution and uh, feel free to open it up and pick it apart to customize it to your needs. Uh, you'll uh, see here that it pretty much talks through how to use uh, editor scripting utilities to dynamically uh, control the movie render queue uh, with blueprinting. Um, there's a little bit of Python in here, uh, but I actually think I was able to remove it to do this fully with Blueprint. Yeah. Cool. And I think we're going to do a deep dive on another webinar coming up sometime in May, where we'll probably hit on a lot more of, like, it's, it's hard to go in deep on each topic uh, in each yeah. area, but that could be one of them if people want uh, for us mm -hmm. to talk more about how, how to set that up, how to change it, modify it use it for your own purposes. Um, and that's some of the intention of the project too, is to tear it apart and actually use it um, like that. We should mention that, you know, this is kind of free for the community. Like if you wanted to do your own kind of sports show uh, for Rocket League, like you could do that uh, with this content. Um, and so it's something we want to help push out and we'll probably continue to update um, with other releases as the tech improves and we improve in different areas. So pretty cool yeah definitely we hope we hope to see lots of people using this on their twitch streams <laughs> really really soon hopefully um <laughs> I, know, I know a lot of people try we saw some people try to recreate the hype chamber like already ahead of time so <laughs> i couldn't tell them unfortunately like hey it's our, it's coming we're gonna release it but now that it's out there, <laughs> <laughs> free, free to use, yeah so yeah. They were ready awesome. to go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, they were already trying to, to emulate it, so now it should just be even easier. So, um, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And they're building a full graphics package for pickleball, and I'm like, I love pickleball. That's so I would love to see this. <laughs> just throwing that out there. Like, I, I would really like to see a professional pickleball broadcast using this sample. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, there you go. You have the blessing. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think there was maybe like one other question. I know I, know I don't want to like keep this live stream going forever, but um, about if you want to swap out a car in this scene, um, you know, we supply the one Jaeger one, but if somebody wanted to, because I know you mentioned earlier at the top of the show about, you know, hey, you have a sponsor that comes in and they have their own truck or something they want to do, <laughs> like, I mean, I feel like you could just swap the static mesh, of course, but you know, there's materials, there's other things that kind of go along with that. So, I mean, is there any kind of considerations that you could quickly kind of cover on that? Yeah, we'll definitely touch base, talk, talk about it more on the webinar. Um, but the way we set it up in the project is you can pretty much select a blueprint instead of selecting a specific static mesh. That way you can, mm -hmm. you know, have your own static mesh that might have its own light set certain sections, might have its own like animation mm -hmm. data in it, might have its own materials. and it's also accessible via the data table. So you can say, uh, okay. you know, this team is sponsored by Pickleball and they can have their own uh, blueprint car with its own, mm -hmm. like, you know, custom material. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was something that kind of came from that discovery. Like initially, I think we just had the cars, right? And it was fine. And then as soon as we're like, oh, we need another mesh. It's like, ah, 
right there's a lot that yeah, goes i was like correct <laughs> like, yeah. the lighting setup doesn't work for every match like the, the you know the, the materials are not identically named or, or, or in the same order so um you know putting it into a blueprint container did make a lot of sense so yeah yeah cool i see i see one question pop up someone's asking hey this is in ue4 will we convert it to ue5 and will it be ready and available on release um just so you know behind the scenes you know right now obviously this project started last spring and carried through the fall like five isn't fully out we're still in preview um so we're in process of converting that to five right now our hope is that within a very short amount of time of the release that we'll be able to have like the version five Obviously, with that, we're evaluating like you know what comes new with five, so Lumen, Nanite, all the kinds of bells and whistles, and we want to make sure that yeah. it's polished, uh, you know, in in the the right ways. And maybe there's certain things that we need to slightly customize. But all the blueprinting logic, data tables, everything you saw that Warren was doing is definitely going to be there uh, and supported right out of the box. So so no needs. It's it's mostly I would say visual quality uh, could even be better than what we're we're doing now with yeah. all the temporal up sampling and, and uh, TSR stuff uh, is going to be awesome. So anyway, yeah, um, definitely uh, look out for that. And I'm sure we'll put out a little bit of uh, marketing, you know, behind it as well. So, yeah. So yeah, there will definitely. be further iterations of it moving forward as well. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And we're, we're continuing to work with the Rocket League team and, you know, there could be other crossovers to come, you know, they have several other events throughout the rest of the year, uh, stuff happening in the summer, uh, the majors aren't over, they still have worlds, um, you know, there's many areas of broadcast that we could hit on of, you know, augmented reality, LED walls, you know, those kinds of things of how do we, how do we populate that kind of content with using Unreal, so um, good things to come, we'll see. Very exciting. I don't, well, I don't know if we want them. Um, no, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was going to maybe like close, like Warren, if you could share your screen, the capacity did a great breakdown, I feel like, on the project. Um, and so just to point people over to them as a, a studio for reference as well, we'll drop some links in the chat. But um, yeah, just thanking them for being a great partner to us throughout the last year, to the DreamHack team that, you know, did all the actual kind of on-site production of stuff and uh, obviously to Corey and Monty and all the guys at Psyonix that really helped kind of put it all together. It wasn't, you know, we were kind of the brain bar, if you will, behind the project, trying to help uh, devise the systems for things to run. But ultimately, like those teams, we couldn't have done it without them. And uh, we're just super happy that we were able to push out, you know, a sample that um, was actually used on real world stuff um, in this space. So super cool but yeah, yeah here's a bunch of the breakdowns of different content that uh that they made and you know, i just encourage others to kind of check out their site they got lots of cool uh content on there so um, yeah i was gonna say one of the other things like say so anytime i can't say every trailer but usually when there's a rocket league uh, it's like a uh, new new season starting they do the trailers for those as well so and they they also do that in unreal <laughs> so they show some of that inside of their uh on some of their other work um, area on the website as well. So definitely take a look at that stuff too, because um, you know, all that's post rendered, of course, it doesn't need to run in real time. But it's just again, they're using the engine um, for most of their content production at this point. So really, really cool stuff. Yeah, I mean, this was just an absolutely incredible sample that is, first of all, congratulations on all of the work that you put into this because it's just incredible really is the best word that i can find for it it's incredibly user friendly it's very intuitive to use it's ability to be adapted to different teams different formats different colors all of that just makes it really an incredible piece of work and first of all like i said congratulations on that because it looks amazing i'm super excited as well to see what, how other people end up using it as well because i think there's just endless possibilities with it and there's going to be so many cool things that come from it also yeah also incredible demo by all of you as well that came up in chat several times everybody was just saying how well done the demo was it was a great way to go through show all the different capabilities in a way that's understandable 
easily digestible because <laughs> it might be a little overwhelming at first to just open up the sample and kind of look at everything. Be, oh, what do I do? There's so many things. So that was a great way to break it all down into its simplest pieces for sure. Yeah, I, 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 I feel like uh, I got to give props to Warren <laughs> for, for mm -hmm. most of like the pro like uh do you know just making this as simple as possible to understand you know because uh, i feel like the same way when you open up a lot of projects there's a lot of like trickery that's usually being done you know because we're you know that's just what's usually required and i think he made it very very simple to digest and understand so i appreciate that a lot <laughs> thanks 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 yeah definitely like, like andy yeah, said absolutely. we'll we'll definitely go more into it on the webinar when we uh, have the date like stay you know stay on the lookout for it um, we can try to continue more of that. Yeah, absolutely. Keep an eye out for that webinar. There's going to be so much more great information. I'm sure even more tips and tricks that we wouldn't even be able to fit into this. Um, there's still some things that were shown in this that are blowing my mind, like having the extra, um, the screen beneath the stage that's then just reflected up onto the screen. I never would have thought of something like that. That's such a cool trick. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's props, actually a really good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah really that's why I love these live streams. You pick up little nuggets here and there, you mm -hmm. know, towards stuff. And obviously there's things we can cover if people are interested more on the asset side of Cinema 4D and importing assets and prepping them mm -hmm. for this kind of thing, the ray tracing and look development. We kind of honed in on the scripting and the logic behind this. You know, that was a little bit more of the focus, but happy to touch on mm -hmm. many of those areas if people want. Yeah, absolutely. I know there was one question that I have to ask, otherwise I'm never going to hear the end of it. Are the fruit screens available in the sample or is that just for you? <laughs> they, I'll figure something out. We'll, we'll put it out there. The yeah, they're not, they're not okay. shipping in the sample. That was just a webinar, you know, exclusive. Dang. It's a web exclusive. <laughs> See, there you go. All right. Now, now, now the Fruit League is just, it's out, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to make your own. Yeah. Sorry, people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, yeah, I mean, I was going to say, the only other thing I was going to maybe mention is just a couple of upcoming things. I mean, I know they mentioned we're going to do the webinar on this sometime in May. Obviously, Unreal 5 is coming soon. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there will be lots of uh, stuff around that. Um, we're going to be out at NAB. I don't know for people that are in broadcast, like it's one of the bigger events that uh, usually happens. It's a conference. So we'll be out there. Um, there's Rocket League uh, championships this summer coming as well that we'll be working on. So lots of other cool stuff coming that we'll be um, hopefully, hopefully get to see some of you people in person. Uh, <laughs> and then also, uh, you know, more, more stuff that we'll push into the sample project, hopefully. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, mm -hmm. I don't want to cut it too early. Is there anything else that you for sure want to be able to show to us today? Any little other sneak peeks? Mm -hmm. Well, we wrapped it up pretty well. Nice little bow. <laughs> I was just looking through the chat to see if there's any others um, there, but I think everyone's excited for five. I know that. I see many questions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. I. No. Yeah, I can't really think of anything else right now. I mean, I like to kind of keep it short and sweet if we can on this. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And of course, there were so many questions that were answered in chat as well, which the chat is mm -hmm. also always saved with our VODs. So if anybody missed any of those, whenever we put the videos back up, feel free to dive back in and run through that chat so you can see those questions and answers. A lot of things were also answered directly in there. So don't miss out on those as well. But other than that, I just want to take the time to thank the three of you so much for coming onto the show today and walking through this incredible sample with us, answering questions. It was incredible. I know you're all very busy, <laughs> so I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to come on here and speak with us today.
Yeah, thank oh, you so much. Back. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, Tina. Hopefully we'll do it again. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. Come back. <laughs> but as well, thank you everybody who came and watched today's stream. We post all of our streams in video format that you can be viewed on demand on our YouTube channel and on Twitch afterwards on our channel, Unreal Engine. Don't forget to keep up with us at Unreal Engine on all social media, as well as don't forget to follow these three as well, we have their handles up on the little name cards here. And don't forget to come say hi in our forums where you can get the latest news and also find all the links associated with today's stream, as well as that link to go download the sample for yourself and give it a gander. Other than that, thank you all so much. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day and I will see the rest of you next week. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Cool. Thanks so much. Yeah, bye.